Colter, you know what I call people who only grill in the summers? What's that, Gus? Morons. There's no better time to grill than in the middle of winter, boots on, snow falling, nose freezing, meat sizzling. And if you want to be the master of the winter grill, you got to make sure you're stocked up on Alpine Touch. The pepper blend is an old standby. The, the prairie fire will certainly keep you warm on the inside during the cold winter, and the chili sublime will remind you of warmer summer days to come. Alpine Touch, available at retail locations around the state of Montana or at alpinetouch.com. Alpine Touch, Montana's special Join spice. Town Pumps, Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any town pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com slash rewards to register and start saving. Right down the road. Pump it up. Oh, yeah. Tuesdays with Tutel. We missed last week. Sorry. I was trying to work so much that I could take days off, but I decided to dress up in my Ryan Tutel costume for you today. Yeah, very nice. nice. I'm doing fantastic, man. Uh, very happy to uh, get back on the horsey here with you. And uh, we got a couple of weeks of football in the state of Montana left, so that makes me happy too. We uh, we got you got to tell a story about where you're at on Saturday because you were trying your bestest to get back to Missoula, but then that wasn't going to happen. So, but then you got to take in the game from a new spot. It's always fun watching. I actually, I know you're kind of like me too. If you can watch a game actually by yourself, that's actually like a nice experience. Like if you get to yeah. be in a public place by yourself and just kind of be alone with your own beer, <laughs> that's a yeah that's a spot to be. Tell them the story. Well, I uh, you know I've started a trucking company, uh, Coulter, and um, I am the trucker, uh, and I had a load to take down to Gunnison, Colorado, that kind of came up like early to midweek last week and then i also then found one coming back um going to eureka uh, of all places and you know i you and i have the same affliction where we just think that um space and time don't apply to us (laughs) and we just assume that we can just oh yeah i'll make it i mean three days no problem i'll shoot down there i'll be back i'll zip up it's all good but it just takes longer than you think it's going to take and um, there's also restrictions on how much you can drive professionally or commercially uh, from a legal standpoint that you have to abide by and all that kind of stuff. And at some point, it just became clear as I was in northern Utah waiting for my clock to kind of reset that, like, I'm not making it to Missoula for this game. And I'm just I was just like, you know what, how, how, like, how is this happening? But in any case, what I ended up doing is is just shooting as quick as I could and ended up making it to Dillon. And, uh, I mean, if you got to be in a place to watch a game, Dillon, Montana is pretty tough to beat and, you know, found a little establishment there, got myself a hamburger fries, actually no beer because I was still on the, you know, doing the driving thing. So I had several waters, uh, and, uh, (laughs) but that also kind of helped because, you know, you don't like phase out details at that point either. Um, and I watched the game, with my mouth agape, just like everybody else. I mean, it it was just um, as good as it gets. I must say, as nice as it was to watch it where I watched it, I uh, have had, I've experienced a fair amount of melancholy that I was not in the building for one of the absolute all-time days and games in the history of the stadium and the history of the program, both programs, honestly. I mean, that is an epic football game as a semifinal uh, to go to a national championship and 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 what a game it was. I mean, just uh, I, I know that you've covered a lot of this on Nuanas now and so on, but the back and forth, 16 points in regulation for 60 minutes, then no one can stop anyone in the right. overtimes. And um, I mean, I'm I'm aghast. My biggest takeaway from the overtime period. Uh, aside from you know of course the junior bergen experience uh, and 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 just the insanity of the touchdown that on tv a lot of the guys couldn't even tell if the looked like the the umpire put his arms up right away but he's kind of buried in the corner and no one could yeah. tell if he was actually across the pylon but he was and and then obviously that two point conversion which is just i mean there's there's nothing to say other than just amazing um But for NDSU, they ran four plays in double overtime or in two overtimes, scored two touchdowns. So half the plays they ran were for touchdowns. 
they were all runs right up the middle between the tackles, and it was absolutely unstoppable. And then the two-point conversion that you absolutely got to have, you roll out the circus you know, yeah. format with your just your your just high flying trapeze act. How and much I'm is just like coaches being coaches though, right? I mean, you got two defensive minded conservative coaches that just coached 65 straight minutes worth of football where nobody wanted to make a mistake and you're totally buttoned up and conservative. And then you're like, Well, we've been practicing this two point play since spring. This is the time to do it, and then you both we... <laughs> well, and you know, for Montana, I do think that they needed a little something. You know, I, yes. I don't know that they're going to run it right up the gut and p- put sure. a two-point conversion and, in. And running a wide receiver reverse pass with Junior Bergen is not, all things are not created equal in that situation. That's Junior right. High school quarterback, like the, the guy knows how to yeah. throw football. You know. Yeah, that's right. And 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 by the way, it's a play that absolutely shouldn't have worked. But obviously, it was also with a face mask. So you'd have been at the one, and then what do you do? The tush push or whatever? Who knows? But you know, it didn't get to that point. But for NDSU, they they were not they were unstoppable they were unstoppable and to run that play i mean i realize that you've i don't know man like to your point these coaches they have this thing they get it put together they know that like in this moment they've predetermined kind of that they're going to do it and sometimes that's good because you're prepared you don't have to make a decision in the moment you don't want to make a decision in the moment but also like just run the dang ball up the middle and probably score two points and go to a triple overtime. But that's not how it worked. I will say, after the Grizzlies missed an extra point in regulation, and then in the first overtime, North Dakota State scores and kicks the extra point. Then in the, uh, Montana's ball, they score. And I sat there and said, oh, my God. What if the Grizzlies lose this game exactly the way the Cats lost this game For sure. to NDSU in overtime on a missed extra point? But uh, that didn't happen. Buried the extra point, and on to overtime two we go, and we all know how that went. But, um, I mean, that's how that's how football – that's how championship football should look, man. I mean, it's just a thrill, an absolute right. thrill. And, um, you know, you, you just – it's kind of one of those, even, even the, the, you know, a couple of NDSU players afterwards who are of course despondent and sad and like they're in their season is over. And in these cases, career's over. And the one guy goes, but you know, if it's got to end. What a memory to end like, right? This, this is, you know, this is how you kind of want it to go uh, other than winning the whole dang thing. And and it's true. I mean, you got an experience for everybody that was associated with that game, players, coaches, fans across the board that you're going to take with you for a very long time, in many cases forever. The thing that was just resounding to me, two, I mean, twofold. One, on a personal note, I, I couldn't believe just sort of the bookend of my life because the the only two games that I've watched at Washington Grizzly Stadium that are comparable are the one I watched on Saturday and then 2009 versus Appalachian State in the semifinals, which happened to be the last time the semis were in Missoula. And right. I was I couldn't help but think that back in 2009, I had just graduated college. I had been freelancing for the Missouli, and I was yeah. a month away from moving to Washington and moving out of Montana for the first time in my whole life. My brother was a redshirt freshman on the Grizz. All my best friends were seniors on the Grizz. And it was like this rite of passage. For me, I was about to go through a rite of passage, and that was like my closing of my college chapter watching that game. And now – here I am 14 years later, I just got married, we're having a kid, and that was like the closing of that chapter for me. But it, right. also, it was also striking to me because I couldn't help but wonder, I don't want to be too cynical about this, but my brother at one point looked up at me, we were saying, I, I fought my way down the sidelines. I was like, I can't sit in this stupid press box, I got to be on the sideline for this. So I got yeah. down the sideline, at one point during the first overtime, Brooks looks up at me and he says, Man, the FCS sucks. They should definitely move up. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it's like, right. He's like, I wish, I mean, what are we talking about? Why can't we just have this all the time? Okay, if people hated on it saying it's just going to be the Mondak All-Star game for the rest of time, it's like, well, that's fine. If this is the games that we get, bring it on. Let's do this. Let's every, go. Let's do this every December 16th, oh, right? By the way, like, I mean, that's the nature of football. In the NFL, a two NFL teams played a football game, and the final score was 70 to 20. <laughs> and then another right. one, a final score was 63 to like 21. But then you have 
the AFC Championship between the Bills and the Chiefs where they score two touchdowns in 13 seconds and you just can't believe what you're watching when Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. This is the nature of football, man. You get blowouts against teams that don't want to be there and aren't up to your level, even if you're in the same division, in the same conference, whatever, and then you get games that make it all worthwhile and are the whole point of what you're here to do. That's football forever and always. Enough with this, oh, what level are we at stuff. Exactly. Well, and I, I just think that, we're going to see a fracturing. I don't want to go on a tangent about what that looks like, but it's very well possible that that is among, if not the last times we will see a true showdown like that, where both Montana and North Dakota state are at the peak of their powers. Cause we just don't know what's going to happen. And we might see several years of this or whatever, but it was also a rite of passage for the Grizz, like for Bobby Houck to come back and say RTD and all these things, and then to have it not come to fruition whatsoever, but then for him to have it start to come to fruition and internally the belief to be so high and he's in a contract year and his son doesn't play for the team anymore. And they have this underdog group of guys that nobody believed in before the year. And then midway through the year, we're sticking a fork at them and saying that they're already finished. And then to get to beat, I mean, if you were to name the top 10 FCS programs of all time, most of them aren't in the FCS anymore. The three that are still in the FCS, there's there's probably six that are still in the FCS, and Montana just beat Montana State, Delaware, Furman, and North Dakota State in a row. They just beat four of the remaining top six teams in the entire subdivision in yeah. a row. Talk about a, yeah. a moment for the Grizz to sort of reascend, and now here they are, and uh, it's inarguable now. They are absolutely one of the nation's elite teams. You know, it 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 totally is, and I, I mean, this is just maybe to highlight the point, but I I I'm not a Tom Brady fan by any stretch of the imagination, but the Buccaneers run in their Super Bowl run on the road beat Drew Brees in New Orleans. On the road beat Aaron Rodgers in right. in Lambeau. On the road, I forget who the other one is, but another just Hall of Famer that Tom Brady's just put into bed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers of all team of, of all teams, and then they go and they win the Super Bowl, and it's just like. I just feel like that this run for for Montana at the FCS level is that that sort of thing, and now, <laughs> you know, they beat they beat the historically no question best team in the history of the FCS in North Dakota State, and now they have to beat the no question best team in the FCS this year, who's like just hands down and head and shoulders better than everybody else at least up until this point, but. I think you got to say right at this, at this moment in time, we got the two best teams in the country playing in the national championship. And that is exciting. And that is as it should be. And that is, and by the way, these two teams haven't played each other. I mean, you can say, Hey, Montana say they had their shot, you know, and didn't quite get it done. Well, now the Grizzlies are going to have their shot at, at the champs in Frisco. And uh, it's, it's, we got a long way to go to talk about that, and we certainly will, but it is a great matchup. The uh, Bucks wins that year. They they won at Washington. So, okay, so whatever. But then they won in New Orleans in the Superdome uh, against Drew Brees, as you mentioned. Then they won against uh, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers in Lambeau. And then they won in the Super Bowl, of course, uh, against Patrick Mahomes. It's Tuesdays with two tell. Yeah. Take a break. We'll be right back right after this. Has a loved one been charged or accused of a crime? If so, the stress can leave anyone feeling helpless and alone. But you don't have to be alone. Hi, I'm Dave Maldonado, and I've successfully defended Montanans for over a decade in these situations. So if you're tired of being scared, let's get you prepared. To see how, visit BigSkyDefender.com today. You are not alone. Visit BigSkyDefender.com to find out more on how you can fight back against local and federal criminal charges. Or I gotta ask you about your Knicks shirt. Wait, wait, when is this? You're not a Knicks fan. No, it was at Ross. It was six <laughs> bucks. So I needed a shirt. I bought it. Here's here's a, here's a good one for you. Tuesdays with two tail. Here on SkylineSportsMT.com. I uh, they they had some something similar to this, except for it was like a a barrage of Edmonton Eskimos or Edmonton Oilers uh, gear. Yeah, and they had like ten. Double XL Edmonton Oilers shirts of various varieties on sale for two dollars each. So I bought them all. I can't tell you how many <laughs> times, can't tell you how many times I got stopped in public. Oh man, big Oilers! So, Connor McDavid's the man. I'm like, yeah, dude, Connor McDavid's the man. 
Um, I got to say, um, as professional jerseys go, I have the Edmonton Oilers as number one in the NHL. I think they're sick. so sick. And a very similar scheme and look is also the the uh, New York Islanders who have certain schemes that really work for me. But I think those Edmonton jerseys almost every time, no matter how they roll out, are just sick. I love them. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm on the Edmonton Oilers. And I think the best college football uniform, while we're on the subject, the Oregon State Beavers. I think Oregon wow. State slays with their black and orange. And like when they do the cream white, oh, it's just, it's so real in, yeah. in Corvallis. So too almost bad they're a D2 as team. As, almost as good as Penn State. I knew you were going to do this to me with the Penn State. <laughs> Uh, uh, back to the epic game in, in Missoula on Saturday. Yeah, I do think it was fitting that the narrative coming into the game was both these teams have very similar strengths, right? Efficient, strong leader quarterbacks that maybe aren't like spectacular in the numbers, but take care of the ball. Run games that can be powerful, great defenses that they, they that you can lean on, and the great special teams. And so then I thought that the narrative coming into the game of whoever makes the first mistake is going to be the team that loses the game. And neither team wanted to make a mistake. There was mistakes made, certainly. I mean, North Dakota State's penalties, the Grizz missed kicks, both those things played a factor. Uh, But I thought that that was why maybe you had this slugfest game that then turned into this just complete bedlam down the street. It was like the the pot of water was about to boil. And then once they got to overtime and they had short fields, then the bo- it just started boiling over all over the place. Yeah, uh, uh, totally. And I think it, it is sort of odd the way it is. I mean, I, I understand why college football has the overtimes that they have. Um, and I'm not even an advocate. I used to be an advocate of just doing away with that. I just, I hated it. And I still hate it in the sense of it's not football. I mean, they're they're doing football plays, but there's no clock. Right. There's no going up and down the field. It's really hard to like make a stop. It's just it isn't football. Um, it is high drama. Yes. And yeah. and it is fair. Like you have to say one thing about college football is it's it's even. You know, it's as even as it can be. And in that sense, it's it's a good. You know, you, you can you can kind of accept the outcome. Um, as far as it goes so uh it was and but but that's what you get I mean that's why you can have 60 minutes where you score 16 points and then eight minutes or whatever where you score 50 <laughs> because right. Right. I mean you know these these overtimes like this so I mean it, yeah just 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 crazy and again to uh, uh, essentially perfectly even match teams doing what they do on the biggest stage the I, we just I actually just left a, a media interview with Bobby Houck, and uh, my, one of my big questions in the game was they rolled Grant, Grant Glasgow, the freshman kicker, out there for the first kick, which was a forty-seven yarder, and he stroked it. And then they went back to so they've had this kicker sort of carousel. Glasgow was nails the first half of the year. He nailed three forty-five plus yard field goals against Idaho. That was an absolutely key factor in the game. Then he got kind of got the yips, and Coach Alk talked about it. He said, hey, it's just like a golfer with their golf swing. Sometimes you just you can't figure out how to hit it right, and then it kind of gets in your head. And so then they went with Nico Ramos, who's the senior, and he was great, and then he became ungreat. He missed a couple of kicks against Furman. He missed one against uh, North Dakota State. But I asked him about that, and he said that they have sort of two different kicking packages. It's all based on down and distance, and – and well, not not down. I guess you're only kicking on fourth down, but distance, field position, what hash you're on. Glasgow's the guy for the long field goals. Ramos is the one for the short field goals. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting, but I thought that the special teams battle, the game within the game, was a fascinating one because. And Marty Morningwake said this uh, in the in the days leading up to the game too. He said the number one flaw that that coaches across all levels of football have when it comes to special teams is even if they see a crazy dynamic return guy, like a Devin Hester or whatever on the other side, they think, well, but my team's better than the team I'm watching get this kick housed on them. And he said it all week. He said, North Coast State's got to accept that it doesn't matter, man. You're not better. You have to not kick it 
to Junior Bergen. Well, it was clear the North Coast State's game plan was, well, we're going to angle punt it to the North Coast State sideline so that they can't get he can't get back to the the Grizz sideline return, which he loves so much. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter. They, they angle punted it to the North Coast State sideline. He still got all the way to the other side. It's just crazy at this point that, first of all, teams kick to him, but second of all, that this guy can rise to the occasion. I mean, that's like an impossible feat to – to house three punts in the span of five weeks, including back-to-back weeks. Yes, it is. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know what to say. To say, um, Bobby Howe very understatedly said he's got a knack for it. There are some guys. Devin Hester was never a great wide receiver. No, and he's not a great wide receiver despite being very obviously faster and quicker, which are two different things than everybody else on the field by a country mile, but he (laughs) never really was a great wide receiver, but you just have that thing where when everybody's running downhill at you, it's not a matter of even vision. I mean, certainly vision's a part of it, but it's, it is the instinct of that particular skill to go with a great physical skill set. Uh, which which obviously Junior Bergen has, um, and and guys just have it, man. And uh, I thought uh, Coach Entz and Coach Hauk both have alluded to this in their post game. Bobby Hauk has been saying this for for weeks, but um, the other ten guys on the punt return team too, they know that they're one block away from sending this thing to the house, and they they care very much about how they're doing to try and spring their boy, you know, and, and they do a hell of a job of it. Um, I thought a couple things though, too. So it's obvious to see the, the Bergen punt return. The Grizzlies blocked the first punt of the game, which was called because of an offside, ironically, or false start rather. Yeah. North coast Um, third of that possession. Right. Right. And, and that is another talking point. I mean, we all know how electric Washington Grizzly is and never more electric than it was, you know, certainly on Saturday. You got to be disappointed if you're a Bison fan in their utter inability to deal with that in from a, from a, from a, from a penalty standpoint. I mean, my goodness, like that's, that is way I get it. You get a couple false starts or whatever, but like I had 10. I mean, I don't know. Just, just, they had I mean, eight. They had eight, yeah, and, and six of them came on third and short. Like you right. the ball down Montana's throat, and you get to third and two, and you're you're it's a dream come true for Andy. So you got 240 pound quarterback who's your gun run guy. You got 230 pound running back. I mean, this is like what you want, and then you false start, and all of a sudden, like N said, when it goes from third and two to third and twenty-two, there's no plays for that. And, 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 and a lack of execution. Other play, I mean, they had, they had a couple wide open, just straight cement block hand drops yes. um, of guys w- w- that were going to be huge plays for them, uh, potential touchdowns, but certainly big first downs, field flipping types of plays that were straight drops. I mean, they had it dialed up, they executed it and dude doesn't catch the football multiple times. So, I mean, I think you got to say, if if you want to look at like did the better team win? Well, yes, because NDSU NDSU made more mistakes than Montana made. Period in that football game. Um, also, though, we all know how big a deal special teams is to Coach Halk. Obviously, he's the special teams coordinator for the team. I don't think there's a more aggressive unit in the country, and I'm talking about uh, returns and kicks you know both directions everything they're always on the uh on the offensive on special teams for bobby Howe. and i'll tell you what uh coach anson ndsu sumo wrestled them right off of the mat on a fourth down when they had to have it and the they set up montana to try and come and get after the punt on the left side on the left side of on Montana's left. So the right side of, of the kicking teams uh, sideline, they, they pre-snapped it to get the shift to happen. They got everything they wanted out of Montana and the Grizzlies were coming after that kick and they straight fake, fake the kick and ran it around the left side. And there was nobody home. And the, that's a moment where you go, 
there's three minutes left in the game. You're up a touchdown. Get the football back. Don't even put a kick. Re- just play straight up 11-man defense in a base D personnel and make sure they kick this football away, period. You get the ball back, done deal. It doesn't always have to be, oh, we're going to go get it. You know what I mean? And I thought that NDSU did a supreme, superb job in that moment of – of using the the offensive and aggressive strategy of the Grizzlies against them, and guess what? They went and scored an epic touchdown of their own. I mean, what what a drive when you got to have it at the end of the game. You scored nine points in a football game in 59 minutes, and you have to have it, and you're going to the north end zone, and they go get it, and you go, my God, that's the Bison right there. That's That's them. That's why Cam Miller – the All American list came out today. That's why he's a second team All American. He threw for like twenty three hundred yards and eighteen touchdowns. Nothing crazy. That's why he's an All American, though, right? Because he had that. Exa- he had a two minute drill to tie the game in Bozeman. Yeah, down, down the stretch, and then two weeks later, as well. I mean, man, two minute drills to go to overtime in Bozeman and Missoula on the road. That is just as well, as you can be. And you're in the room for the press conference. I of course watched it. How could you? How could you build a better temperament for your quarterback than that kid? Right. You know how what I mean? In the post game, man, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable, phenomenal. I mean, and and you just see that, like that's that's why they've won, you know, nine, ten national championships. That's why they are the standard of the class, and and it's it's everything that goes into it, but it's also the type of person of the type of guy that you get there and how they, what they develop into, you know, you, it, it's, it's, it's program level. It's bedrock level, man. It really is. At Blackfoot Communications, our mission is to connect people, businesses, and communities, bringing a world-class fiber network to homes, communities, and businesses of all sizes, ensures Montanans have access to fast, reliable, and secure internet and phone services. Are you ready for fiber internet? To find out if fiber is coming to your area, visit goblackfoot.com slash ready for fiber. Connect to more with Blackfoot Communications. I want to go back to Junior Bergen for a minute because yes, you're right. A lot of the supreme kick returners are guys that maybe that is their 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 special talent and their skill. And he absolutely has a special gift for it. He also has just a gift for football. Yeah. I mean, how often do you see the the 47 yard punt return touchdown and end with the guy dragging two tacklers into the end zone or like the touchdown he scored in overtime? He straight trucked two NDSU guys. I mean, this guy weighs 175 pounds. I mean, he's he's 5'10, 175, and he he he's been an outstanding running back. He can throw the ball. He's the, a, one of the best slot receivers in the country. And oh, by the way, he's the best punt returner and the best kick returner in all of the FCS. His diversity of skills is just so impressive. And both the overtime touchdown that he scored and obviously the punt return, easily those could have both been stopped a yard or two sure. short. It is such a big deal that he got those home. You don't want to be first and goal on the two against North Dakota state, man. You just against anybody, but you right. just like when you got the chance, when it's right there, you got to get that thing in because there's just too much that just, that, that you know, you give it to Nick Osmo and you think, Oh, well, of course he's going to get there. Well, mm, not so fast. And by the way, the same thing happened for NDSU. They were sitting there right on the one yard line and had a full start. And so you, you, you know, you just, just score. Like when this, when that happens and some guys have that nose, have that ability to say, okay, there's the pile on, I'm going to get it. And junior Bergen is absolutely that. All right. I was going to ask you this and uh, so now we're here to this point. So yeah, I have a whole bunch of different reasons, but I want to know your reasons. Give me the top three reasons why Montana has been able to reach this point in the season and go back to the national championship game. Um, I'm going to give you four because I can't not include junior Bergen as sure. I mean, just it, Bobby Houck said, I mean, without junior Bergen the last two weeks, two weeks, we don't win either of these football games, you know, and it's all over. So, so I'm putting at four junior Bergen. Okay. At three, taking the season as a whole, and this run, I'm I'm going to say Clifton McDowell. Um, the steadying force 
initially and then the just outstanding play at times. I don't think you would say that he, that Clifton McDowell on Saturday was was at such a high level that he was the reason that Montana won. But I think you got to say that over the course of a season, he has been an outstanding quarterback for this team. He, a, a team that was going in the absolute wrong direction, um, he came in and was the very obvious and singular change uh, personnel-wise that made that, that, that steadied the whole ship. And then he even has been uh, ascended to a point where he's played a couple elite football games. Um, he hasn't played elite game in and game out, but he has been, he has been solid at worst. And when he's been at his best, I mean, he is a problem out there, uh, both and, and dual threat. I mean, again, sometimes, in the FCS, you get a guy of the stature of a Clifton McDowell who's 6'4 and 220 or whatever he is, and he can run over everything, but can't throw the ball a lick. But Clifton McDowell, he is he has really turned me in terms of belief of him as a passer. I think he's done a phenomenal job delivering the football uh, at times, both downfield and also it's in spots in the short and intermediate passing game as well. And is he the greatest reader and all that kind of stuff? I don't know. I guess I I wouldn't even be I wouldn't attempt to at, to answer that question. But here's what I do know: he's got great instincts and he can extend plays. And his ability to move around and find guys and then deliver the ball or just take off when when he wants to call his own number um, has made all the difference in the world for this Grizzly football team. So I, I have him very high on the reason that this Montana football team has gotten to this point. Well, and he also, because he does, dual threats are in vogue in college football right now. He's a different than a dual threat guy, though, because he can run it, but he's a power back. Like, he, mm. he's not. He's very, like Cam Newton. I mean, he, he's not that fast. He really isn't that right. fast. Like, he right. doesn't really, like, get to the edge that fast. But right. when big boy gets rumbling, he'll truck your ass. So Yeah, you know, he will. And and so, but you you do have to have a little. He also is, has his most underrated skill is his improvisational skills, and right. that's where Brett Pease and and Bobby Houck deserve so much credit. Yep, their willingness to let quarterbacks improvise have been what non-existent in the in their time until this year, and then they figured out, hey, this kid, okay, let's give him one read, and then maybe two. You know, we'll give him the the short side reads, and then. That does work. Hey, roll to this side until one of these guys comes roll, roll it over uh, across the middle. Like against Idaho, all they were really doing was playing playground football. They were just rolling McDowell out right and left. And oh, when one guy comes open, fire it. There it is. So, but you know, one that, thing I, uh, that one thing talk, Matt, it's talked about how that was such a huge part. They saw that improvisational ability. Then you have mm-hmm. to game plan for it. So even if McDowell doesn't have his best game on Saturday, he's influencing the result of the game by just existing. And I do think too, people. Um, don't give enough credit to the fact that improvisation, well, I mean, we, we call it playground football, right? But, but they practice this. There are rules right. for this, especially with this great group of wide receivers that the Grizzlies have. They know, hey, man, if, my, if I run my post corner and it ain't there, here's what I'm now going to do. And even though it's not scripted in that sense, everybody's still sort of on the same page of how this thing is going to look and go. So there's options for Clifton and for the, for that receiving group. Um, when, when a play quote unquote breaks down or when it has to, you know, spill the pocket or whatever the case may be. So, you know, it's not just, it's not just, ah, we'll just, you know, throw the dice out here and see what happens. Like, no, they're, they're working on this and they know where to go and what to do. And that's why it becomes almost a second play within the play um, and can be successful for them. All right. So that's three. What, what, what is your second most important reason? Um, the second most important is Bobby Houck and, and the coaching staff along with him. Um, I think that we have seen at least externally a distinct shift in persona uh, in Bobby Houck, which I think is absolutely tied to the style in which he has coached this year. That's not about the tenets of his beliefs as a coach of toughness and of, uh, you know, strength and of doing, you know, even even the style of football or anything, but just his approach 
as a person to the players to to what you know to to the way that he is um coming across uh and and also the coaching staff Brent Pease as but also I mean there's a big shakeup obviously with you know to the defensive coordinator and linebackers coach leaving last year you know right. retiring or whatever it is you get a whole new staff and but everybody on the staff is the same except for one guy but everybody on the staff is coaching a new position except for right. one. only Justin Green is still coaching the same position that he was coaching well and Bobby Howe <laughs> and Bobby Howe right yeah <laughs> right. right but yes and and so and and by the way, we look at the first part of the year and we talk about the guys on the field and stuff like that. But I think the coaches were also still trying to figure out what what are we doing? How are we going to make this thing work together? You know what I mean? What How are we going to put the right ingredients in the right amount at the right temperature in the pot to create this, you know, to create this masterpiece, this five star dinner? And um, and they were able to do that. And, you know, you got to say it starts with the head man. Right. And I think that he he's changed or at least he has acted differently in the second half of the year from the first half of the year. And it feels to me very deliberate and very clearly this is playing out on the field as well. And so, um, again, I, I've given Coach Hauk a ton of credit, uh, more credit than I've ever given him uh, for for turning a corner in some sense. Uh, and again, some of that remains a mystery. But um, but I think that you have to say that it's real and that they are absolutely hugely responsible for this this immense success that they're having now. Well, I think one of the most refreshing things that has evolved has been that Bobby Houck, I think, and his staff, I think they realized that you can maintain the ethos and values of toughness, hard work, discipline, this militaristic attitude that they want their program to encompass while also having fun. <laughs> like while also, you know, having fun doesn't make you soft. You right. know what I mean? Like you can, right. you can be tough and also polite. Those two things can happen at yes. the same time. And I think, I think they did realize that. I think, I honestly wonder this. I think there's a lot of factors that go into this. First of all, I think that, you know, I think that when he first came back, I think that they overrated how soft they were. And so they, they overplayed all the mm. things they needed to do to get back to being tough. Yeah. I also think there's a distinct element here though, where Bobby Houck's program is by and large made for guys to come in and be in it for five years, not less, not more five years. You redshirt with all of your friends and you live in the dorms and you build this bond and you lift at six o'clock in the morning. And then you go take your lumps and you're on the meat squad and you don't get any glory. And then you get to play on some special teams and then you get to be in the rotation and then you get to be a star and then you get to be, you know, God like Braxton Hill is now, you know, like right, you get to be right. like the man and you know, now you're an all American and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's the deal. If you're in it for longer than that, I think it wears you out. You get tired of it and you want to be done. I think if you didn't start out in it, even though they do have some guys that have been transfers that have either been short-term transfers or long-term transfers, they've acclimated to it and been good to great players, but it doesn't work as well. When you have this core group of guys that lives with each other and they work with each other and all that sort of stuff, I think that helps so much uh, as well. And, and then I also think this, I think that when Bobby Houck was the head coach at Montana the first time around, there wasn't long-term contracts. He had to have an edge. He was literally coaching for his job every year. Now, was he ever going to not have his job when he's winning seven straight Big Sky titles and right. going 80 and 17? No. Right. But that's the way he's wired, and that's the way he he coaches his coaches. Like, Coach Gregory, I will tell you, Bobby Houck used to yell at him every year and say, boys, he used to yell at him once a week and say, we're coaching for our jobs. We're on year-to-year -year contracts. What the hell are you guys doing? We got to go. We got to get better. We got to go harder. And there was like that sense of urgency. Well, now Bobby Houck's in a contract year. I really think that that has colored this season as well. Mm, that's a yeah, that's a really a, a very interesting point and and a good one. Um, I mean, there was internal conversations had after the NAU game because that was an embarrassing loss. The way that he reacted to it in the post game was also very embarrassing for the University completely. of Montana. Yeah, there there was conversations had internally about that. Well, 
kudos to the administration too then because Bobby Houck has been the king of the of the athletic department but also the man that has no one to really answer to he's just sort of like this autonomous figure that lives in this mm. castle up on the hill I gotta say good good job by Kent Haslam and his administration for saying hey what's happening isn't is it good enough specifically when it comes to the interactions with the public and I mean coach Houck has had I would say no embarrassing press conference moments or or nothing that was like, you know, in your face. Bad. Shameful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's always going to be stern. If you ask him a dumb question, he's going to be a smart ass to you. That's just how it goes. Or if you just ask him any sort of question that's not articulately presented to him and that's fine. He, he has a high standard and he doesn't suffer fools. And he's also just like naturally a smart Alex. So it just kind of happens. But <laughs> I, I do think that them, I think that there's it's a it's a whole cohesive thing though. Yeah, I really do think that. And look at it now. I, I think the athletic department, the like the the symbiosis of the environment was was not good a, a couple for a couple years there. And you look at it, you know, the all sports trophies. You got, I mean, the women's sports at Montana finished last in the Big Sky. How how does that happen? How do you finish dead last? It should never happen. But now, Lady Grizz are better. The soccer team even was like the the crown jewel of the deal, and then they like finished sixth last year. Well, then they get back on the horse and they they win the big sky this year. Everything's yeah. going better. The track is going better, and then the yeah. football setting the pace now it it pushes everything forward. So I do think they deserve credit as an athletic department for all of that as well. Yeah, no doubt. You know, um, on that on that note, Kent Haslam, as we know, and he said to us explicitly. Being in front of the camera, being behind the microphone, it's not its not his forte. It's not what he, he wants to do. And part of that is, as an administrator, he really actually wants the glory and the praise to go to the coaches and the players in the departments and the teams. So he, he's not out there. He's, he's deliberately not out there trying to get attention for himself. That said... He probably deserves what you've given him, but he probably deserves even more credit than that. But it's all stuff that we are not privy to. And and in a sense, that's probably a good thing at a certain level. Like you'd much rather w- want that sort of innate humility in, in an athletic director than a guy who it's all, you know, got to be about me, you know, and it's, you know, look at, look at how good I've done. But that said, um, I think he could help himself out a little bit too by – you know, identifying, Hey man, this is, this is where we were at and this is what we had to do. You know what I mean? And, and, and that sort of thing to acknowledge the hard work that it has been as a department, as an entire, you know, athletic uh, uh, department top down to do what has now happened, especially in the football program and on the field. So, you know, again, kudos, kudos to the whole crew there. I mean, you can't, you, you don't go to national championships on an Island, man, you just don't do it. And so uh, it's, uh, you hear people talk all the time, the alignment between a president an AD, a coach got to be there and um, not knowing the realities of all of that, uh, which we don't and and may never. um, It certainly is working out where it looks, it's reflecting well on everybody right now. Right. It's just reflecting well on everybody. I mean, even the, even the basketball team's got the Grizz fever. Like I said, I talked to Travis to He was like, man, how about the community? The community is a buzz with football. You know, he's yeah. like, I was talking to the lady at the Safeway. She's never been to a Grizz game. She's like, I'm gonna buy her some tickets and go g- deliver them to her. <laughs> Get her to the Grizz game. She's never been to one. I'm like, that's awesome. You should do that for sure. Join Town Pump's Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any town pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com slash rewards to register and start saving. Pump. Run down the road. Pump it up. Oh, yeah. All right, so number one thing then. What do you think is the number one determining thing? Yeah. Montana's going to Frisco. I mean, it's it's the easiest thing in the world to say, but I hope to have a little more a little more specificity. But it's the players. And 
you kind of highlighted, hey, you got to be here five years. You come in as this group, and then you, you know, you advance through the stages of development of Grizz football. Um, but all those, you know, every kid in that press conference on on Saturday, what do they say? Well, I was just a walk on. I didn't know if I was ever going to have a chance. I didn't know that I'd ever get, you know, get an opportunity. And now here, you know, here they are, the stars of the game: Keelan White, Junior Bergen, Braxton Hill. Um. There was a moment at NAU where it looked like we had a mutiny on our hands and it looked like some really good players didn't want to play. And it looked like a bunch of other players who maybe aren't even as good were maybe going to follow that lead to some extent. The players have to decide what they're going to be about. The dude's yeah, you know, you get this thing where you're a college football player. There's some level of indoctrination that happens at every program, like, you know, the things that we believe in and the brotherhood and the thing. But, like, at some point, you as a player and then you as a group of players have to decide what you're going to be about. And these, these players, these young men, made a decision, and I got to think that it was a – a, a deliberate decision, you know, it wasn't some, sometimes things just sort of innately happen or whatever. I think this had to have, have a full conversation coming out of NAU and going forward. Who are we going to be? How are we going to represent ourselves? How are we going to represent this university, this program, the history of the players that have been here before us? I think you hear a lot of guys on the team who've talked regularly this season about groups of players that have preceded them and wanting to be the next in that lineage, right? So, so how about this? You and I did, or even this year, still did several college game days together this year, but we did ESPN yeah. College Game Day for six years together there at the base of the walking bridge. And you see all the people that are going into the game, born into the game. And we would see former players from time to time, particularly the ones that just live around Missoula, you know, the Dylan McFarlands and Shane McIntyres of the world, like those guys, they live, they're, you know, they're attorneys in town and, you know, okay, but – the last month or six weeks since the cat game, I actually since the Sac State game, I have seen that number of guys that were all time great players increase tenfold. And I've seen the return of guys who I have not laid eyes on one time in a decade plus that have been back. I have seen Tremaine Johnson since he graduated from the University of Montana. He was back at the CAC game. I think he was at this last game too, right? And that's just one of many, many guys. Like, I mean, well, while we were doing college game day, we were just doing – I mean, everybody was coming over and saying hi. We were just doing shout-out after shout-out, his name dropping. Yeah, Keenan Curran, flag. Jamal raising right. the flag, right? Exactly, the whole thing. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I, I do think there's an element there, though, too, because I think that – the way this team plays reminds those guys of the way they play. It's about yes. what it used to be about for the yes. first time in so long. Yes. And to to get to even dial in a little bit more in terms of the players, explicitly the defense, man. Like you see this with this group of guys who I think you said so well, like 99 is a 99 on Madden, right? Governor is, he's just, He's a ferocious beast and he is a game wrecking type of player. And you got to have a dude like that somewhere. And he just happens to be the nose. And then you got 10 guys who are all 86s to 90s on their Madden rating, but they all go so hard and they rotate through their, I, I think, again, credit to the coaching staff. There's so much fresh, um, you know, they, they almost, it's almost like a hockey kind of uh, line changes that they do running guys in both on the, on the lines and in the, uh, the, the linebacker spots. And they, they play for each other. They play, they look like they're having fun. You know, it's so like a lot of guys playing football look like they're having uh, Tourette's or something, like some sort of <laughs> like, weird, like, dude, are you, are you okay? You know, and obviously you have to be a little bit mental to play football, man. Like you really do. It's, it's that type of game, but also like they're about it. They're about each other. It comes through when they're playing. And I think this defense, um, you know, again, having a no star really kind of system has lent itself to being one of the top units in the country. And 
and it ha- and it has improved so drastically. I mean, again, the this team, I have never seen a Grizzly team get better week over week at a higher rate than what this team has done. And to go from losing at NAU to mopping up the number two team in the country in the last game of your regular season to then going on a postseason run that includes Delaware Furman and now North Dakota State, it's it's spectacular. And again, there's a lot of credit to give, but I don't, for me, there's no credit uh, to go higher than the guys on the field themselves, both the way they're playing, but 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 more the buy-in and the choice that we are going to do this at the highest level possible for each other as a brotherhood. And, and you see it like it is, it is out there. And, and, and especially when it looked for a while, like it was going to go exactly the other direction. I mean, that's why it's so stark. It's not because this is the goal that every team has. Yeah. This is like, I mean, I'm just talking to nothing but cliches right here, but the reality is they're very hard to end up getting to that point. Most teams never do. And especially when there's points in the season where it looks like the opposite is in fact true. And there's infighting and there's quitting and there's all kinds of stuff. And now all of a sudden you look like band of brothers, you know, and, and uh, it doesn't happen on accident. So T- tip of the cap to those guys and guess what they get they get to reap their rewards in frisco texas and play for a national championship man it's so unbelievably rare there's nobody who gets to say that you know but these kids do and they deserve it so good for them it's it's awesome and you know i did a big story on levi janet carroll last week but we were talking about his house and he lives with governor tyler flink riley wilson braxton hill and David Kopeck. It's like, well, first of all, I asked him, I said, who's buying the groceries? He said, oh, we got to, you got to split it up. Everybody's got to buy their own. Cause if you got to, if you want to cook governor dinner, that's 50 bucks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. But I do think that just being close to each other and like talking about it, talking their way through is, is all good. So, uh, okay. We only got about two minutes left, but I got some yeah. homies for you. Okay. I need you to watch a couple South Dakota games back South Dakota state games back on some ESPN plus. Cause we got to do another one of these next week. This was sort of a, remembrance of what was an epic uh evening at washington grizzly stadium now yeah preview gotta look forward my number one question for you is the grizz open at 14 point dogs 13 and a half is what the line is oh baby so don't need to answer it now but uh, let's let's both review some tape i've obviously watched south dakota state a lot because of all their endless crossover with the cats i mean they play the cats in non-conference 10 times in the last whatever and they also play the cats in the playoffs four times in the last yeah years but uh, i want to get your thoughts on the south dakota state team so we'll have another tuesday with two tell next tuesday and uh, a forward look at uh, the jack rabbits of south dakota state and how montana matches up thanks for being here buddy can't wait what a treat love it have you or a loved one been charged or accused of a crime if so the stress can leave anyone feeling helpless and alone but you don't have to be alone hi i'm dave maldonado and i've successfully defended montanans for over a decade in these situations So if you're tired of being scared, let's get you prepared. To see how, visit BigSkyDefender.com today. You are not alone. Visit BigSkyDefender.com to find out more on how you can fight back against local and federal criminal charges.